was your first like paid job in in the industry um, on Star Trek? Actually, my um, my first paid job ever was when I was four, and I did a voiceover for Sesame Street. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so I feel like I was kind of my first job ever kind of put me right into that world. So I, I was surrounded by actors. My dad was an actor and my aunt was an actress on Broadway. And um, so my grandmother knew a lot of crew people and directors and camera people. And that's how they got me on Sesame Street. That's cool. I wish I remembered it. I don't remember that, but. <laughs> and was, did you, did you not do any acting stuff when you were a kid up until being on Star Trek? Just theater. I did a lot of community theater and school plays. Um, so I auditioned for a lot of plays and some I booked and some I didn't. But I think my first big one was when I was 10. It was a play called The King's Cream Puffs. Mm. And so uh, that kind of started me on the road. I think I memorized everybody's lines, my mom said. So, <laughs> And then my first professional job was on Star Trek The Next Generation when I first moved out to Los Angeles. Okay. Because you're, you're, are you, are you uh, originally from New York? My mom is from New York, so I always had a lot of family out there. Um, but I grew up in Arizona and Los Angeles. My dad lived out here. So my parents got divorced when I was very young, and I'd split my time between Arizona and L.A. Okay. Yeah. And what was the um, process of getting the role on Star Trek? That was actually really interesting because I had, I had just gotten to Los Angeles. I'd been here less than a year and um, I wasn't sure how to start or where to go. So I signed up at Central Casting to do some background uh, or stand-in work. And mm -hmm. so they called me into Star Trek to do stand-in work for Beverly Crusher because I had red hair at the time. Oh. And so I remember showing up at the Paramount lot with like me and five other actresses to kind of audition for the part for the stand-in role. And uh, we had to go meet the director on set. So I, I grew up being a Trek fan anyway, so I was so excited just to be on the set. Like, I didn't even care if I got the job at that point. I was like, I can't believe I'm here just to audition for this. And they picked me out uh, to do the stand-in part. Um, and then on my first day on set, they said, do you want to be a regular crew member instead? <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure. So I got my own uniform and they'd bring me in about three or four times a month for the first couple seasons. So it was kind of a dream job at that time. You know, I really learned how to be on set and uh, kind of learned the ropes from the film end. Mm -hmm. And it was just an incredible way to get to be a fly on the wall and be a part of that show. Right. And so after Star Trek, um, in between that and... American Gothic, like, what well, did you start dubbing and dubbing an anime in that well, time? Well, I, that afterwards? Right I'm sorry. Did you, did you start dubbing in, in anime uh, in between that time frame or was that after 95? It was, a. Uh, it was, would have been right after 95. So after Star Trek, I, I moved to New York. I had an opportunity yeah. to, um, to be an intern at an off-Broadway theater company at Playwrights Horizons. And so I spent a year interning there and just doing a lot of uh, off, off, off Broadway theater. So it was such a great learning experience. I met some incredible people, writers, friends, directors, people who are still working today. So it was, it was like going to a master class for that year in New York. Um, and then I heard about Wilmington, North Carolina. I had a lot of friends down there that were working, doing hair and makeup in the film industry. And they said, come on down here to get your SAG card. You know, you're good. there's a lot more auditions available because there's less actors, less of a pool. Mm -hmm. So I went to Wilmington and pretty quickly, within the first few months, I booked a recurring role on Dawson's Creek. Okay. I, yeah. I guess American Gothic was first and then Dawson's Creek. So it was American Gothic was the first one. And I got my SAG card on that show. Um, and right around that time, I met Michael Center Nicholas, yep. who was working at a studio there. Crosswinds, I think was the name of that studio. They were there for a few years and he was doing a lot of theater and I was doing a lot of theater. And so we met in the actor pool, hanging out at bars after doing a show. And he said, Hey, do you ever want to do voiceover work? And it had been a long time dream of mine. When I lived in LA, the first time around my, my friend Shelby knew Cree Summer 
And so she was telling me stories about Pre, who was still so young then, and people didn't really know who she was. But I heard firsthand about all the animation she was doing. And so I knew that was a dream, but I didn't know how to get into it. Right. So when Mike offered, was like, hey, come audition for this anime we're doing called AD Police Files. I was so excited and I just wanted to get in there and give it a try. And it was so fun. And that kind of got the ball rolling. So he got me my first part. And then after that, I auditioned for Oh My Goddess. I think it was the second thing I auditioned yep. for. So that just kind of, for that, for after that, I just, I kept working for a good 10 years there in Wilmington. And with um, playing Belle Dandy in the OVAs, especially, um, since she's such a like iconic, like motherly character that a lot of people like, uh, what was your approach to doing that voice? Well, it was interesting because it was still so new to me. I hadn't dubbed before, um, but I had done some research and I knew from Mike Center Nicholas, he had given me some insight that, oh, oh my God, this was, this had such a big fan base already. So I, I watched the original a lot, which was something our director encouraged. And I became such a fan of the original Bell Dandy, the Japanese Bell Dandy, Inue Kukuko is so incredible. Yep. And so I, I wanted to find the essence of the character as an actor that felt real, which there was so much of her I related to. Um, animal, she's such an animal lover and like just little pieces, little scenes. I think my very first scene I auditioned for was the, with a bird hand landing on her hand oh, yeah. and I acted it out in the moment like I just was like oh and I kind of did the scene and so the director was like well that's it she's doing it in the studio but it's, it's the only way you need to do it I was like well let's act out the motions um but it was just it was such an incredible experience and so I really tried to hear listen to Inue and try to get little moments that she had that I thought were so beautiful and so perfect um and so I, a lot of the incidentals were ones that I directly copied from her. Okay. Um, the, the back breath, my director would always be like, we need a back breath here. And she did the uh, kind of little bell dandy back breath that Inue did. And so I tried to, to pick up little things from her. So that was sort of my guideline because I thought she had done such a perfectly beautiful job in that role. I just wanted to, to you know, honor her in some way and, and be okay. Right. And with the with the TV series, was there a reason that you were Payarth instead of Bell Dandy? It was a different company, so oh, okay. that actually was produced by a studio up in New York, and uh, with Mike Center Nicholas, funnily enough. So it kind of came around full circle. Mm -hmm. So Mike was doing the show up there; he had already moved there, um, and he had already cast Bell Dandy. And so it was, I don't know, maybe a year into it, and he called me and asked if I would come up to New York to play Payarth. And I felt like it was, uh, <laughs> I had gotten older. I was maybe 10 years older at that point. So I felt like it was kind of graduating to the next role up, you know, to play the older cousin. So it was mm. really fun. That was really fun, but hard. It was hard for me to let go of Beltanthe because I love that character so much. Probably my favorite character I've ever played. So I wish I could play that character forever, but I thought um, the girl that did it then was so great. And we even got to do some commentary together. Yep. So it was really fun. And Payorth was such a fun character and so, so different, complete opposite. Right. So that was a really good experience as well. I like to try to broaden my range and do different characters. So that was a fun challenge. Yeah, I think that the, 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 the difference in all the different goddesses is really um, unique and interesting. And I think, so too. Are so, and I think yeah. they've all done a beautiful job. You know, they're yeah. all great. I know with the with the TV series too that people like Veronica Taylor and Mary Elizabeth Nicolin were in it too. Um, do you do you know them very well or? I don't know them at all. No, oh. I only know the people <laughs> that I work with on my versions, like the, the OVAs. So I know all those actors because we all worked together a lot in that little film community, which was great. So we all did TV and film and theater together, and so voiceover was just you know at the time something we did to help pay our bills. It didn't pay much, but uh, we just all loved it so much. And it was such a great, just another great aspect of acting that, you know, a lot of people didn't realize at the time, oh, we get to do this as well. This is incredible. Mm -hmm. And now if I could just do that, I would be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> and with being in darker anime, like Earthian and Crusher Joe and stuff, um, was that more exciting for you? 
wouldn't say more exciting, just different. Like mm-hmm. I, I love acting so much and I love, um, part of what I love about it is that you get to play different characters and bring different parts of yourself to those characters. Um, so to get to play some of those other ones was, was really fun and really challenging for me. Bell Dandy felt kind of natural. Mm-hmm. Like it came from a, a very natural place. I'm a huge animal rescuer and, you know, I love magic and I believe in magic and, you know, so all those little things I really related to her, whereas mm-hmm. some other characters were really challenging. Uh, Virtua Fighter was, um, you know, more of a fighting show. And so right. like I got to work on that aspect, which I'd never done, which was really fun. And Pressure Joe, of course, was just a great show and a lot of fun. So yeah, they were all really different. And I, I loved that about, about those shows. And then I got to move into playing some boys. Yep. So that was a little, little different, too, like Clamp School Detectives and some of those shows. I do. I was wondering if you remember, since with uh, the character that you played in Earthian, that she, you know, kind of sacrifices herself and, um, like, mo- yeah, what the, like, emotional place that you have to go to is and how do you get yourself out of that when it's something that's really intense? Mm. Um. That's a good question. I've done a lot of theater in my life. And so um, I think it's easy for me or I enjoy going to those really kind of darker emotional places as an actor. It's a really fun challenge to tap into parts of yourself or maybe things that you've gone through that put you in that space. And so when I do the voiceover, it felt really freeing as opposed to theater or film where they're watching all of you to be in that studio and just do an emotional scene where I had to cry or I was being tortured or so many different things my characters went through. I feel like it was almost easier to just kind of put myself in that space and imagine that I was in that situation. And, and that felt really freeing. Like it it was almost like, um, I almost felt like sometimes it was therapy because you'd walk out of there after like crying and freaking out for four hours and I'd walk out and I would just feel so much lighter. I'm like, oh, like all that just, you can just let that go. So for acting, I I never have had trouble letting go of a role when I'm done. If anything, it feels better. Like I feel like that part of me got to be expressed and then I could just relax. (laughs) I did lose my voice a couple of times though with certain shows. So we would save like the really emotional screaming parts till the end. And then for a few days, I was a little hoarse. So we would have to like schedule accordingly. And with uh, playing Sarah in in Virtua Fighter, this is probably obvious, but um, were you getting physical in the booth and like with all the fighting noises? I I was, I want to. And so it's always hard for me because my director would have to say, you know, don't move your head. Keep your, keep your head where you are and you can move the rest of you. So I had to kind of temper that a little, especially with Sarah, because I wanted to get so physical in there. But you have to have that technique as well so mm-hmm. that your voice is getting recorded properly and you're not like all over the mic so he can't get a good record. So that was something to take into account and very different from, you know, theater where you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, the physicality with voiceover stuff is one of the most difficult things. Mm-hmm. Because I want to be physical, but I also know I can't move my mouth too far from the mic. Mm-hmm. So I I like that challenge, you know. And with uh, playing Noko Nokoru in the Clamp Detective series, uh, how did you come up with that voice? Too was it kind of based off the Japanese? Also, definitely. Like I always listen to the original and try to um, get something from there that will inspire me or help me find the voice. And I will say with Kaicho, that was probably the most challenging voiceover role I've ever done because when I, I remember when I first auditioned for it, I thought, you know, I'd been playing Belle Dandy and I played uh, like Elf Princess Rain and some other yeah. characters that are magical girls with a very high breathy voice. So I knew he couldn't sound like that and I wasn't sure I didn't want to try to sound like a boy. Like I thought that sounded kind of fake and phony. Mm -hmm. So I remember I went into the audition and just kind of happened. I didn't think I'd get it. I was like, that's never going to happen. And then when I got the call (laughs) that I booked the part, it was my favorite director, Scott Houle. He's an incredible director. And so I remember sitting in there for my first session and I couldn't find the voice. 
Oh. And we were getting, we were both getting frustrated because he was like, mm, that's not quite right. So finally he played it for, he was like, I said, well, let me hear my audition. Like, I don't even remember what I, how did I do it? What did I do? How did I get this part? <laughs> and so he played the audition for me a couple times and I realized it was more a place of energy, like an energy that I brought to the character as opposed to like deepening my voice to sound like a boy. Mm -hmm. He was just really excited, like very excited all the time. And so I thought, oh, okay, that changes my voice. And through that, I found him, but I would have to, before every session, I had a couple catchphrases that I would have to do like in the car to remind myself, where is that voice? And he, Kaicho would always slide into his words. He'd say, he'd, uh, one of them was like, well, hey guys, what do you think about that? And so I'd have to like, I'd do the, well, hey guys. And that kind of reminded me like, okay, it's that energy and he slides into stuff. And then I'd be right back into it. So it was really fun. Cause I, at that point, I didn't know that I could do that. And so mm -hmm. it was a great learning experience for me. And what a fun character to play. He was so great. And uh, is that doing that voice specifically, was that like easy to sustain or was that kind of wearing after a little while? Once, once I found it, it was easy. Like once I realized it wasn't me putting on a fake voice, like trying to sound like a boy, like that yeah. was straining. So once I realized it's just this place of energy for this young guy, this young kid, um, then it was kind of easy to find. But it was funny, those first three sessions, I remember I was like, I even said to Scott, who our director, I was like, you can replace me if you need to. Like, I am not sure if I'm going to be able to give you what you need here. So I was so thrilled when he didn't and when we worked on it together and we found it. And it was such a great show to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm always especially interested in hearing the process for women who do boy voices in dubbing because um, the sometimes the you know, process and placement is always different with everybody. Absolutely, which I find fascinating. Like I, I got really into looking at interviews with actors that had done that just to see like, what did they do? Like, how did they find it? And then we even did a show right after that that never got released um, where I played a younger boy. Um, what was it? We did two episodes uh, and it was based on a game and we didn't get get the job like it went to some oh. other company I think they never actually dubbed it but that was even more challenging and so I got to do two episodes as Bao was his name and if I could remember the title I would tell you but I can't write now it's probably for, I'm probably not even allowed to so but it was <laughs> such a fun experience to get to try to try to do that and I was so proud of him too because he sounded different than Kaicho so I love when I get to audition for stuff like that even now try mm -hmm. something different and how did the general um, process of recording change as the years went on, like as it got closer to, um, you know, modern technology? Not different at all. Okay. I actually have just recorded some stuff here in Los Angeles, um, uh, dubbing for a Netflix film, actually a live action. Mm. And that was a little different. Like they had a, a software that I'd never used before, the rhythm technique where it's it's different but it's visual as opposed to just the three beeps yep. which sometimes we would do we would record often with no beeps because okay. i would rather just watch and get a feel for the for the lip flap so i could get the dub right mm -hmm. um so honestly it hasn't really changed that much though i did a commercial last year and they still did the beeps mm -hmm. so it's for me under the headphones it's pretty much the same process i know on the other side of the window it's not <laughs> but I don't know as much about sound editing. And so I'm sure the, the technology today is so much better, but they still use Pro Tools. So yeah. Scott who was using Pro Tools back then and I know they're still using that now. So uh, other than the American animation is so different as you know, right. like that. And I've only done a couple small projects. I'd love to do more, but that you record first. Um, only once did they film me. So they were trying to get my expressions. And then later they animate to your voice. So it's very different. It's kind of the opposite process. Um, and also a fun challenge, I thought, too, because you don't have, I love dubbing because you, it's like watching a movie. You're watching yeah. the movie just like everybody else is. And as an actor, I get to just throw myself into that movie and pretend I'm there um, with 
Western animation, you really need to use your imagination more, mm -hmm. which is great too. Just very different. And do you know whatever happened to the other two women that played the the leads on the Clamp series, Shannon and Allison, I think? Let's see, I know who did we have in that one? Um, I do remember uh, one of Ashley is still, she's in Wilmington. And I, I don't know the other girls. I know the yeah. um, Yo My Goddess team and the You're Under Arrest team really well. Yep. But I'm not sure. I don't know about those other girls. No, they were Wilmington actors. Okay. And then uh, prior, before I go to You're Under Arrest, I know that you were in um, Princess Rouge, which is kind of like, it's a mixture of, you know, the magical girl thing, but it's also dark fantasy. So I was yeah. wondering if, if your approach to that was any different. That one, I remember when we first um, got that title to work on, we felt we felt it was very diff very similar to Oh My Goddess. Like it yeah. had a lot of similar tones, similar story arcs, um, but yeah, with a little bit of a darker tone. So I didn't want her to sound like Belle Dandy. I wanted it to be a little different, but she's still in that breathy magical girl realm. So I don't mm -hmm. know how different she was able to be, but that was a really fun character. It was only a two or three episodes. So we didn't get to do as many of that one. Right. Um, but it was, I thought it was so beautiful, like really beautifully, beautiful animation, very different. And with uh, You're Under Arrest, um, since that was so many different, you know, episodes and movies and... Uh... Yeah, that was great. We worked on that for like three years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you also just base um, Miyuki off the Japanese? Well, Miyuki was different because Joanne Lozado played Miyuki for the first four episodes. Oh, so okay. she, a few years before I got to do it. So they did like the OVAs and it was a huge success. Like everybody mm. loved, um, it was Joanne Lozado and Tamara Burnham and they were amazing. Um, and Joanne was a friend of mine and okay. she then moved to Los Angeles and they, and they just picked up the series so I remember our director calling her and saying, will you come back and do this series? And she said, no, because it doesn't, it didn't pay much. Yeah. <laughs> so she, she was like, no, I, I'm in Los Angeles now trying to get work that pays my rent. So I'm going to stay here. And she said, why don't you talk to Juliet? <laughs> and so he was like, that was my next call. So it was great. So I, I had Joanne as a template to listen to her between her and the original Miyuki. I felt like I had a really good pathway to follow. And if anything, I'd say Miyuki was closest to my own natural voice than probably right. any, any character I've ever played. And sure. probably closest to me in personality too. I'm a oh. good mix between Miyuki and Bell Dandy, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that you're like Payorth at all? Not so much, but there's a little bit in there, for sure. There's like a, a little bit at times, you know, but yeah, not as much. She's so conniving, you know, yeah. and that, I, don't, I don't really have much of that in me. <laughs> but so fun to play. Like that was, I remember playing Payorth and there were a couple beautiful parts with Bell Dandy and Keiichi that Payorth was a party to like getting them together and getting them to finally kiss. And so I'm such a dork in the studio, I was crying. And he's like, why are you crying? I'm like, because I'm so happy for Bell Dandy. Like, that's just such a dork. <laughs> I was like, this, I said, this whole story is very meaningful to me and I love it so much. So even playing Payorth, I felt really honored to get to be a part of that storyline for Bell and Kay to kind of progress their relationship. I thought that was so cool. Right. And was there any relatable aspect with uh, Tai Cho with you two? I might be kind of silly to ask, but. <laughs> <laughs> And from Earthian, like from that, or no, that was oh, TikTok. Oh no, um, Taicho from Clamp the Clamp series. Oh, Taicho. Well, he was kind of like that fun, crazy boy that I wish I could be. Like, there's that part mm. that I'm like, oh, if I could just for one day, like, be somebody else, I would <laughs> want to be this badass kid who can like make anything happen. Mm -hmm. Like he was, he had magic in the way Bell Dandy did, but not, but, but practical, practical right. magic. You know, he could just make anything happen. He was so uh, convincing to people, and I love that. So I wish. It's like a dream part of me. <laughs> and I think probably one of the last anime that you had worked on that still actually has a good following today, too, is uh, Blue Sub 6. Such a great show. Such a beautiful show. Yeah. Yeah. 
I loved that one. And um, that was a great character for me because she didn't have a lot of dialogue. Mm-hmm. So it was really about finding UTO's language, and it was that was an incredible challenge. Like that, it was it was hard, but so fun. And then the lead on Blue Sub Six is one of my dearest friends here in Los Angeles, Michael Granberry. Oh, and cool. so he's incredible, I think, in that show. And he's an animator now. Like he does stop motion animation, and he's won three Emmys, and he's wow. just an incredible artist. Um, but people don't know what an, uh, what an amazing actor he is. So I love being out with him and I'm like, do you know what a great actor he is? Check out Blue Sub Six. Like he's so good in that. Right. And, um, uh, well, I mean, you just said this too, but, um, yeah, I was wondering how restricted that was to play her since she doesn't really have, you know, really any emotion. She has a lot of emotion, but just no Not language, like just weird, yeah. You, yeah, like weird noises that she would make that was really mm-hmm. fun. And so as always, I kind of go back to the original Japanese because they do it so beautifully. So I use that as a template. And I think we did a little more than, than they had in the original. He mm-hmm. wanted her to be a little more vocal, um, but I didn't want it to be too far out of what they established with the original, which I thought was pretty near perfect. Right. So, but I'm glad to hear that it still has a following, that people still love that because that was such a great show. Mm-hmm. And so when you came back to um, Los Angeles after dubbing anime, what was the first um, project that you got? Because I'm not sure like what the order is on IMDb or not. <laughs> I know. I, I, w- I have been really trying to do more voiceover out here, but it's like starting over, you know, it's kind of a right. different world out here. But one of the first shows I did, it's still in, in production. It's still in process. And it's a, it was a pilot called Camp Z okay. um, about uh, zombie kids at summer camp. So oh. I'm really hoping that our creator sells that one because it was such a great show and so fun to work on. So I got to do the voice for that. That was probably my first thing back. And then I did um, a voiceover from Microsoft commercial. So okay. since I've been here, I've booked a lot of commercial stuff which is great for the money, but that's not my first love. You know, I really love voice acting. I really love animation and anime. Um, so that I'm trying to do more of that. I did work on a video game called Bliss Stage, and that was a fun process for about a year. I'd fly up to San Francisco to work on that. So it's a, you know, it's so funny, like all those years of, of voiceover, and now I almost feel like I'm starting over again. Uh, which which can be fun, you know. It's still a great process. I I just had seven auditions this morning in my oh, closet wow. studio. So it's like you know you keep keep hustling, trying to get that next job. Yeah, I think as an actor that never ends. Right. <laughs> well, I think it's a, I think it's kind of interesting that you um you know your history with anime in New York and like since Michael uh, Center Nicholas lives in L.A. too. Now I'm kind of surprised that you haven't been able to get anime roles over there (laughs) yeah me too but i know he uh i did audition for one of his projects last year that they were going to record up in new york okay so i think he goes back and forth a lot yeah i would love to work with him again he's he's an incredible you know director and a genius actor himself yeah so he's just always fun to work with it's been a long time since i've seen him but yeah we we should work together again Mm -hmm. and uh Yeah, this was like in the mid 2000s. But what was your experience uh, working on One Tree Hill since that was, you know, a few different episodes? Yeah, I did five episodes on that show as as like one character. So it's funny. It's it's one of the only things that people um, recognize me for people who are really and it was such a small, small part. But people who love that show know who that know my character right and uh it's funny i've been recognized for that randomly like three different times which you would not expect um but that show was so fun i mean i I loved living in wilmington when we had a lot of production there i think it's coming back now it kind of ebbs and flows um but it was so great to live in this beautiful small town and yet still audition and work on these projects that you really want to do you know sag after productions right Um, these amazing people. So it's a great experience to have this mix of both worlds. Whereas in LA, it's kind of all that, you know, everybody's focused on that. Everybody's works in production in some capacity. In Wilmington, it was a little different. You had your real life and then you had your film life. So One Tree Hill was really fun because the whole town was involved in that show. 
Like even the actors, when they're interviewed, they still, they all love Wilmington and they all go back. A lot of them bought homes there. So it was like a real, you know, real camaraderie with the, that cast. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of on-camera stuff, I just like to ask this too with actors that do both. Um, has there been, ever been anything that you potentially got to be a part of or audition for that went on to be something really major or iconic like TV show or movie wise? Honestly, I think the biggest thing that I've done, I just did a year ago was uh, Will and Grace. Yep. The TV show, we did the Will and Grace reunion show. And that was an incredible experience because I started working on that as a stand-in for Megan yep. Mullally. And I'm such a huge fan of Megan Mullally and have been for, you know, over 20 years. Karen, she plays Karen. Mm -hmm. And so being a stand-in on a show like that, which I didn't quite realize, on multicam, you often have to play the character. And so whenever Megan wasn't there, they would throw me in to play Karen. And that was probably one of the most challenging things I've ever had to do in my life. Because yeah. you're doing it for Jim Burroughs and like some of the biggest studio execs and producers in the business. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you would just have to like take a deep breath, settle yourself and just jump in and just play. And it led to a great role. It led to the creators and Jim Burroughs writing me a role. And they were like, you, we need you to play this. So that was a really fun experience. I felt like it gave me a lot of confidence as an actor to have to mm -hmm. play an iconic role like Karen and do her voice and everything. Like I was, <laughs> I made it a challenge. I was like, well, I've got to do her voice. I can't, how can you play Karen and not? Um, and then I got to play a really fun part myself. I actually played a couple roles and a bunch of voiceovers on that show okay. and it was just an incredible experience to get to work with those people like that was an honor and what what is the um because i've never uh asked this before with anybody uh, what is the what is the involvement to become a stand-in for something major like that for that i had to basically audition um, and they had to know that I could act because I, for multi-cam as opposed to single cam, um, you have to, we have to act out the show for the camera because you've got five cameras and it's like choreography. So, uh, I was lucky enough to get in this incredible team of stand-ins, um, kind of the best in the business. And even last year they had a SAG after had us go and speak to a bunch of members about what being a stand-in is like. And that's just the thing that I started a few years ago when I moved back here. And I was lucky enough to know a director who was directing um, some Two Broke Girls episodes. And um, they needed a new stand-in. So he asked me if I'd be interested. And I just got in here and I wasn't sure what it entailed. But I said, yeah, absolutely. Let's try that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's turned out to be one of those actor jobs that nobody tells you about. It's a great job for actors to pay your bills as opposed to waiting tables or something like that. Cause you get to continually act and you get in front of these amazing people that get to see what you do and appreciate what you do. And so it's fun. I I've always been a makeup artist as well on the side. Oh. So I think part of me loves supporting actors. Like I like, if I'm not acting, I want to be a support to them in some way. Right. And, I think is why I like doing makeup so much so I can make them feel more confident when they go on camera and standing in is the same way. Like I would play the part. And then if there were changes, I would tell Megan what the changes are so that I help. I feel like I help her go and, you know, do her amazing job um, just with little like, Oh, we moved the camera. So you need to make sure you're facing this way and just like little things. So I don't know, I guess I love being a support for actors as well as acting myself. Did you get to uh, interact much with like Deborah or Eric or? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, every day. They were all amazing and made me feel so, made me feel a part of the team. Like whenever I had to jump in there and play Karen, they, you know, they never treated me like, oh, you know, where's Megan? Like they were always so supportive and Eric would always say like, you sound just like her. I didn't even know till I turned around. It wasn't her. Like they were just really supportive and really fun. Like that set was just just so much fun and so much creativity. It was like a master class watching them every day. And was that the last on camera thing that you would have worked on? Um, no, right before we locked down in the pandemic, I got to film a role in a movie coming out called um, Our Almost Completely True Love Story. Okay. And that was sort of a dream experience because my godfather's a director and- oh. 
I've always wanted to work with him as an actor. You know, mm -hmm. I've worked with him in other capacities and, you know, he's been such a, a big part of my life, but it was the first time where he called me up and was like, I want you to play this part. Will you come do it? And so that was kind of a dream come true. And literally the day after we shot, we were locked down in quarantine. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, what a great way to, to finish that off. So that was so fun. And that's, they're still, um, that's still going to be coming out hopefully next year. Right. And then a lot of voiceover over this past year. I, I built a home studio, so I was ready. And I've done some commercial work and a lot of e-learning and a lot of animation uh, auditions. So, yeah, I try to keep busy literally every day. Try to keep, you know, put my toe in the water and, and hope something comes, comes through. And almost every um, voiceover person I have interviewed has also done um, ADR work for like on camera TV and movies. And um, yeah, is that is that one of the most difficult things for you, or is that something that you're kind of more used to now? I think it's. Um, I think my dubbing experience in anime really helped because yeah. um, it's so much easier whether I'm dubbing myself or um, a foreign actor in English. It's because I had that training, I think it's so much easier than if I hadn't. Like, I'm used to that. I know what to look for. I know what, I know, like, look for the rhythms, look for the energy. Um, so I think I, I feel very lucky in that sense. I worked on a film um, last year called Yucatan for Netflix, and it's a foreign film that we dubbed at the Dubbing Brothers over in Burbank. And it was so fun. And I think they were surprised how quickly I picked it up. And I just, I, they said that, and I was like, well, I feel lucky because I've had all this experience in anime. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a good training ground for me for ADR. And I'd love to do more looping and stuff like that. Cause it is really fun. Mm -hmm. I guess. So one of the last things I can ask you is just, what do you have an answer as to what you want your legacy to be? Oh, <laughs> well, if I'm lucky enough to have any sort of legacy to leave behind, I feel like Belle Dandy is probably my favorite character that I've ever played. And I feel like it's such an honor to have gotten to, to put my stamp on that role. Cause so many of us now have, mm -hmm. um, that I, I would love to do, I would love to do more voiceover. Like I hope I'm get to, I get to do more animation before it's all said and done. And that's something I love about this, this job and this work is that you can do this work until you're 90, 100. Yep. Um, I met an amazing actress who's 95 and she's still doing animation and TV work and ADR looping and like, she's like Betty White, still working all the time and doing what she loves. And so that would be my dream is, I, I hope I get to work for the rest of my life doing this work because it's my favorite thing to do. It doesn't feel like work, you know, it's just a joy. Well, thanks for, uh to do this it was fun for me to get to talk to you about some stuff that i grew up with <laughs> oh i love that thank you so much like it's rare lately that i get to talk about the anime mm -hmm. so it just made my day it just made it really fun to get to to talk with you about it so thank you for asking <laughs> i'll be sure to send you the link send you the link once i have it up on youtube too i would love it thanks chris that'd be great yeah thanks. and yes you have a great voice i hope you're doing some voiceover i actually went to school for it locally here um a couple of years ago yeah um, that's but, great yeah but um i guess minneapolis is like the biggest place for non non-union work mm -hmm. so um i would have to you know live elsewhere if i really wanted to make money for it i know which is why i moved to la just right. i was like well <laughs> you get to a point where you're like i need to go where there's more work that's union and so yeah i know the feeling mm -hmm. <laughs> well thanks i'll uh get it up on youtube like today that sounds great yeah thank you so much chris you have a great day nice <laughs> bye